Hello, and welcome to Virtual Pensick University 2021. My name is Epi Pengeli, and welcome to my class on the stained glass of Schwartz Cathedral. A little bit about me. My background is in history and art history. I have a master's in exhibition design. During the pandemic, my coworker and I were doing virtual museum tours weekly for the other members of the design department at our museum. So I've recorded a number of them, both for Penn University and for other teaching opportunities in the SCA. So keep an eye out for those. And what to expect today is that I'm going to talk about the history of this cathedral, as well as look at some of the key windows, and then I'm going to have a little bit of a walkthrough with Google Arts and Culture. One of the benefits of doing a virtual Penn State University is that everyone should be able to see these images a bit better here on your computer screens versus how I normally teach this class out of books in a tent in the middle of the field when it's hot in the summer. So one of the opportunities of revamping this class for the virtual environment is better graphics. A lot of these images that I'm going to use come from Wikimedia Commons, which is a great resource if you're looking for images for architecture and other art pieces, and they are very liberal in their usages for you know, for us, for nonprofit education will purposes. So this cathedral's full name is the Cathedral of Our Lady of Sharks. It's dedicated to the Virgin Mary, and it is a piece of Gothic architecture. You can tell it's Gothic architecture due to the different archways we'll look at later, the pointed arches, as well as here, you'll see the flying buttresses coming off of the sides. Uh, whereas with other types of architecture like Romanesque, the buttresses are solid instead, and the arches are more rounded. Originally, there was a smaller church here that dated to the 4th century, but when Charles of Bald donated the veil of the Virgin Mary to the cathedral in 876, they decided they needed a new church. And so they built one, and then in 1027, um, you know, after times of wars and fires, Bishop Fulbert says, hey, we need a new, new church, basically. At that point, it's been several centuries. And in 1027, the economy is more booming, there's a better agricultural environment, uh, there's a lot of, you know, wine and wheat in the area, and they also want to try to bring in pilgrims, you know, bring them in from Paris, and just get them into another part of France. So this is also a little bit of Bishop Fulbert trying to make a name for himself, build up himself, and during construction, there's multiple fires in the town of Chartres, and the every time the veil of the Virgin Mary is found, which everyone celebrates, they say that it's great, clearly it's an act of God, it's holy, that this veil survived, so we're blessed, let's build a cathedral. This cathedral uh, was consecrated in 1260, and it largely has been left alone since, whereas you'll see in some other cathedrals in Western Europe from the same time period that they've had Baroque editions or, you know, things have been changed over the years. This has not dealt with that as much, you know, being a less prominent cathedral, such as it were in France, it has been left mainly intact, and it's one of the best preserved stained glass windows, or buildings with medieval stained glass windows. In 2009 to 2017, there was a rather extensive renovation to make it more similar to the 13th century, so to return it back to that. And over the years, other relics have been added. So what determines the layout of a cathedral? So it's not, so there is typical to have the western facade of a cathedral and then the eastern choir, you know, the altars here on the eastern side. And there's a lot of traditions that dictate the symbolic arrangement of motifs inside churches. There's requirements of the different cults, of the relics, and the positions of secondary altars that's devoted to the different states. There's also sequences of stories and symbols, which are, you know, there's red from 
north from the north aisle, where with Genesis and God's covenant with man symbolized by Noah. And then in the south aisle is the life of St. John, who wrote the Apocalypse, and the sequence culminates in the center of the axial chamber, chapel, was the scene of the call of disciples, and therefore the constitution of church and the body of Christ. There's also symbols with the east side, again here on the east, the side of sunrise, reminiscent of Genesis, to the west, again with people enter on the facade, which is the last judgment, side, a lot of times there's symbolism for that, there's the side of sunset, reminiscent of Christ's death and the resurrection. To the north, you'll often see images of Madonna and Child and the Incarnation, along with scenes from the Bible and Christ's life. And then on the south, you'll often see Christ's triumphant with, and the second coming, which is announcing redemption and the kingdom of God. And part of that also has to do with the fact that, you know, on the nor in the Western Hemisphere and the northern side, um, the light is stronger on the southern half of the building than on the northern half. So that's part of, you know, they're placing Jesus before the Virgin Mary was having the southern side with imagery of him and, and, you know, the New Testament being more strongly lit than the images on the north side and the Virgin Mary. And the two readings of north to south and east to west combine across the cruciform plan of the cathedral, the cross plan of the cathedral, and leads to, you know, the, the center main altar area. And it also follows the sequences of spiritual associations relating to different categories of saints. So on the south side, you have, um, again, that's the side that's associated more with Jesus. You have St. John the Evangelist, St. Mary Magdalene, the Good Samaritan, and the Death of the Virgin. So things that, again, are more relevant to the New Testament. And then on the north side, you have... I, items from the Old Testament. You have uh, Noah with the carp, the dirt. You have St. Lubin, who's, you know, the patron of innkeepers. St. Eustace for the furriers. St. Joseph for the money chamber changers. And St. Nicholas for the apothecaries. You can also see here on the right hand image, the time line or time stamps for when stained glass was added. The very original from the 12th century on the western front are the older pieces, whereas, you know, the majority of it comes from it is from the 13th century, and then there's smaller pieces of stained glass from the 14th, 15th, and 16th. Why stained glass? Well, there's a couple different reasons for that. One, it helps the, the cathedral become a giant reliquary. So a, a reliquary is the, the box, often jeweled or gold, that a, a piece of the crown of thorns or a piece of a saint's body, or like in this case, the veil, is stored in. And so this entire cathedral is kind of like a giant reliquary. Also, you have to remember, not everyone is literate. So this gives a visual dialogue um, to go along with the sermons. So it gives people things to look up and think about. It kind of has the stories written out in it visually. Most of this stained glass is from the 13th century. And about 152 of the 176 windows are the originals, as I mentioned. You saw in the last slide of the plan, and the stained glass of some of the 13th century was overwhelming. There's recurring themes of patronage, so people who paid for the windows, as well as biblical symbols and stories. There's three categories of the stained glass. On the lower windows, you have saint lives and narratives from Holy Scripture. On the upper windows, you have lives of saints in a monumental fashion, so monumental being big, you know, easily visible from further away. And then you also have three rose windows of composite pictures. The west facade is of the Last Judgment. The south transept is of the Apocalypse. And then the north transept is themed along the Old Covenant. 
The narrative windows generally read from bottom up and left to right, and over the years, a universal bay numbering system has evolved, which we're going to take a bit of a look at later. So that way, academics, when they're talking about the rose windows, they know who, or they know which window they're talking about, regardless of whether it's from now, from 20 years from now, it's from 20 years in the past. This system has developed, and it has very much helped the academia around the subject, because again, this is basically the largest 13th century stained glass collection we have all from one place. There's a large number of different workshops that were used to create the stained glass, and we actually don't know how many. Some of them may have worked together to create a specific style for the cathedral, and, were, and that's based by academic knowledge about the style and iconography, but not much is known, not much is documented about this. So, again, on the upper windows, again, they, these are the parts that have like, a lot of times the lives of saints in a monumental fashion. So, monumental figures of saints are easier to see from afar. And also, as pilgrims, again, the, the goal of Bishop Fulbert was to bring the pilgrims in. As they circumambulate the cathedral, they can progress past the windows and they can still observe and contemplate. The lower windows have easier to see stories which make it easier for them to be understood. So, you know, here is this example. It says, again, Bay 133, we have St. Giles and St. George. In the upper section, we have an image of St. George in combat. So you see him riding upon his horse. In the top left here, it's St. Giles. Bottom left, left is the mass of St. Giles. Top right is St. George. And the bottom right is St. George tortured on a wheel. A lot of these windows are kind of macabre and morbid. Please roll with it. It's part of the story of how people become martyrs, which for a long time was part of how people became saints. So with the upper windows, a lot of times um, with the name the nave and transept um, clerestory of windows mainly depict the saints and the Old Testament prophets, where in the choir, those upper windows um, depict the kings of France and Castile and members of the local nobility in the straight bays, while the windows in the apse hemicycle show those of the Old Testament prophets who foresaw the virgin's birth, planking scenes of the Annunciation, Visitation, and Nativity in the axial window. Again, and on the lower levels, um, there's a lot of narratives, again, as I mentioned, and as you can see here, about the lives of Jesus, the Virgin Mary, saints, and the prophets, whereas the upper levels of the saints, the major figures and prophets, are showing the glory of the Christian church. This here is a very tiny set of images about the rose windows of Chartres Cathedral. On the west facade, you have to remember, this is what people see when they enter and exit. So this is the last judgment. This is, you know, your last judgment. It's why you're religious. And outside of this is the portrait, uh, Portal Royal, Portail Royal. It's a sculpture all about Jesus' life and the last judgment. So here you can see it a little bit clearer. We have him enthroned. We have the evangelist with him. All the different... Uh, old kings and angels flanking. And here you can see a closer image where he sit again, Christ is judged sitting in throne. So again, he's literally judging you. Not very cool, Christ, but I guess that's how we're doing it. And here it's a uh, 12, this is dates from about 1215, so again, it's one of the older windows, uh, and it's 12 meters in diameter. The Last Judgment is very typical theme for West Facades, and around him, in these 12 roundels, are, you know, the dead rising from the tombs, and there's angels 
summoning with the trumpets. And the elders of the apocalypse are those that are coming out of the tombs. Uh, or the elders of the apocalypse are shown, you know, as showing the dead emerging from their tombs. And then the angels are the ones blowing the trumpets to bring them to justice, or to judgment, rather. And this is above uh, these transept windows. We have, on the left-hand side, the Passion of Christ. In the middle is Imitating and Public Ministry of Christ, and on the right-hand side is the Tree of Jesse. The Tree of Jesse is the Old Testament, uh, I don't say belief, but the Old Testament story of how Christ is royal based in his genealogy, because you have to remember that kings and queens at this point in time, nobility overall, were basically given their power by divine right. Like, you know, God placed them above us by being, they're better than common folk like us. And one of the reasons why it was important to show that, you know, Jesus was royal, and that Jesus came from royal birth, was to kind of create the association, the parallels with the royalty that were present in France and other nations as well. But we're in France here, so we care most about France. This is a bit of a closer look at that tree of Jesse. Uh, again, it's taken from the book of Isaiah, and Jesse is a father of King David. And at this point in time, there's also a lot of contention with the French kings and they're saying, oh yes, we, we have the right to rule because we have been ordained by God. This is the southern rose window, which, you know, it's Christ enthroned and he's giving his blessing with his little blessing hand, which you can't see clearly here, but you will see a bit better in a moment. It gets more light than the northern side. And the physical brightness also leads to spiritual brightness. There's more red in it, so you think about, you know, fire and power there. And the southern uh, transept portal has to do with Christ's death up until the second coming. This rose window is ten and a half meters in diameter, so it's smaller than the western facade. And it's made about 1225 to 1230. Jesus is surrounded by the four an um, animals, symbols of the four evangelists. Again, there's the 24 elders of the apocalypse around the edges of the circle. Again, a lot of the themes between them are very similar. They keep being brought up because, again, it's all about the last judgment and going to heaven. And again, that's brought from the book of revelations they're all crowned and carrying um files and musical instrument it's the 24 heads of the priestly families and 12 are meant to be old testament saints who are represented by the 12 tribes of israel and then 12 are meant to be new testament saints who are represented by the 12 apostles you'll also see here the arms of the mokluch family which are the constitution so they are the ones who paid for this, the patronage for this window. And the lancets, uh, these items below, have the New Testament on top of the Old Testament. So on the top, we have, you know, Luke, Matthew, John, and Mark. And then on the bottom, they're on top of Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And then, you know, in the center, it's the Virgin Mary with Christ a child. So Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel are all four Jewish prophets of Christ, so they foretold his coming. And then you have the New Testament literally built on top of the Older Testament. Yeah, that is literally what that symbolism is. Very direct and is, again, utilized a lot throughout medieval images. Yeah, this is a little bit darker of an image, but you can get a good close-up on the middle there. Still a little hard to see the uh, 
different elders of the apocalypse. A little bit of, again of a close up of the evangelist along with Mary and Child, the center. And you can even see the names of the prophets, you know, that's Isaiah, that right there written on, as well as the names written above. So literally and figuratively just on top of, and then again, the um, Montclair family. The various donors are shown. So with the North Rose Window, this is actually my favorite one. It's the most famous of the rose windows from Shards Cathedral because of the Shards Blue. The Shards Blue is very unique to the cathedral um, and this region of France. You know, they managed to make this amazing blue color that has always been struggled to be replicated. It's ten, It's similar to the um, South Rose window. It's ten and a half meters in diameter, and it's from 1235. On the North transept portal, you have, again, it's more to do with the Old Testament and glorification of the Virgin, including the prophecies and incarnation of Christ. And here, you have. You know, the, the four doves on top, um, you know, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We have the adoring and sensing um, angels. So they have, you know, the sensors, the uh, little balls that would get out the smoke and the evil spirits would go out with the smoke and it would help cleanse. And they're encircled by the 12 Old Testament kings of Judah and the 12 Old Testament prophets. The land sits here at the bottom. You'll see have the French royal house heraldry. It says the yellow fleur de lis, a blue background, and the Castile family crest, which is the yellow castles on red background. Blanche of Castile is the mother of King Louis IX, and she was his regent. So when this was made, this is again about five to ten years after when the other ones were made, uh, um, the, the opposite one with the arms of the Macleod family, the Count of Drew. And so here, Flesh of Castile is saying, I'm still important, I'm still relevant, you know, just because I am, you know, the Queen Mother and, and I'm regent, even as Louis the Ninth becomes more, uh, independent, she's still saying, nope, nope, I'm relevant, pay attention to me and my family and what we've contributed. These lancets are seven and a half meters tall, so that kind of gives you an idea of that. And here in the middle we have Anne, or St. Anne Mary's mother, holding the infant Mary, so if you think about it, the exact opposite from the south side where they have, you know, the Virgin Mary holding the baby Jesus. And we have the Old Testament priests and virtuous kings above the villainous kings. So the top, we have Melchizedek, King David, Solomon, and Aaron. And again, you can see their names printed. Solomon right there. Aaron. And the bottom, the villainous kings, we have um, Nebeka, I always struggle with this name, Nebeka, Denazar, Saul, Jeroboam, and the Pharaoh. So, uh, again, going back to the King of Jesse, sorry, the Tree of Jesse, King David and Solomon are both members of that. And their geneal geneal genealogical line connects to Mary. Here we're moving on to some of the apostle windows that are on the sides of the cathedral. This is the Baker's window, and it's one of the most prominent trades in town. I mentioned earlier that they have a lot of wine and a lot of wheat at this time during agricultural growth. It's a really good area for grain. And again, bread becomes the flesh of Christ during the Eucharist. And here you can see 12 loaves separated, um, one apart, 
And they, they're like, oh, you know, that has to do with Judas and the fact that he's suffering, he's the betrayer. We also have um, this window for the life of St. Lupin, the Vintners. And St. Lupin was a bishop in the 6th century. and He was born into a rural family near um, Potia and worked as a shepherd and then learned to read and write from local monks. So you can see here he's with his little herd learning to read and write while other people are drinking and just sitting there being lazy. And through diligence and devotion, he overcame his poor origins, took religious orders, and eventually worked his way up um, to the Episcopacy. Episcopacy. Uh, he has a bishop of Chartres. He was credited with many of the reformed developments that formed the basis of the cathedral's later success, and was therefore one of the most important local saints in the Chartrean litany. And he has two feasts one a duplex um, in his name. The fact that he had been a settler, so a man within the monastic community or cathedral chapter responsible for all his provisions, including the wine cellar, it gave him particular association with wine production. And this is also linked to the Eucharist and wine becomes the blood. And a lot of the civil and religious authorities controlled taverns and charts, and sometimes there's a little bit of debate about that, so having it built into the cathedral as well helps give the image, or it helps reinforce the idea that, you know, we're controlling this, we're in charge of this, we are going ahead and, you know, showing this connection with the religious mindset. And there's been a lot of debate if the bakers and vintners and a couple of the other tradespeople in guilds sponsored the windows or not. Some people, you know, for a while have believed yes, there's other academics that say no. And at this point in time, it's mainly agreed upon that they were not sponsors of the windows. It was just mainly coincidence in the other uh, religious background that led to them being featured in the cathedral along with their predominance in the town. This is just a fun window. It's the zodiac window and it has um, also the labor of the months. And they think it has something to do with preparing for Christmas, which is again linked to Christ's birth. And it shows the various labors throughout the year. So you'll see um, you know, they're doing the winters and the fall with October and Scorpio. You'll see, you know, people harvesting. You'll see people feasting here at the top. And it's uh, sponsored by Count Tybalt the Six, which is why um, he's also featured predominantly in it here at the bottom right. So you're not here to ask questions because it is a virtual recording, but I do want to take a chance to show you, so that then, since we have the opportunity, the outside of the cathedral on Google Arts and Culture. You can see when they did this capture that they captured some of the renovation that was being done. Unfortunately, at this point in time, there's not a lot of images available inside the museum itself. It was not uh, captured inside there. And um, truly, I misspoke a little bit. This is not Google Arts and Culture, this is Google Street View, which is again very useful for looking at the museum. And to the side, um, that actually used to be a. Uh, it used to be part of the monastery that was connected with the museum, with part, and it's been converted into a stained glass museum. And that is, if you ever go, I do recommend checking out the inside of the cathedral, but also checking out the museum. So that way you can see the stained glass in the, and you'll get a lot more um, information on it. They also run the medieval stained glass uh, restoration education center, basically. And that's what they do is they teach people how to take care of stained glass. 
And this is just a fun image of what it would have looked like with color, because again, a lot of um, different pieces used to have color, and whether it's historically based or just fun, I'm not entirely sure, but it is neat to see with all the light set up so you can see what it could have looked like. This is just, again, pulled off the old street view with a little bit of, up here on the main altar. You can get a sense of what it would look like on the ground. And there's the entrance behind us with the western window. This is the Cathedral website, and I just wanted to show it to you really quickly because while we're virtual, you can also learn a lot about them. And they do, this is an active um, cathedral. It is used every Sunday for Mass. They also have a labyrinth um, in stonework on their floor, which, depending on when you're visiting, you may or may not be able to walk on. This is on their stained glass section of their website, and you can see it lights up here on the left hand side where it has what is highlighted, you know, it's telling you about Noah. And then as you go through, it'll show you, uh, going along on the map as well, the different pieces. So, I'm actually going to go ahead, sorry, I'm scrolling down here, and um, you know, we're going to say the West Facade Tree of Jesse. Okay. Click that. We're letting it load. Let me try referencing page C. That helps. Unfortunately, it looks like I might have too much going on with my recording this class for it to load, but this is an older uh, capture. You can tell from looking at this website, a substantial update, May 2007. So this is about 15 years old, not quite. And it does have an extensive amount of information available. Uh, what we're going to do is we'll go ahead and have also have it about the sculptures and other items. So, let's see, let's check out the Rose Windows page. And this is, you know, showing the different layouts and where things are. It's showing you, you know, how everything is labeled here. And I'm just going to click on the one for the Virgin Mary right here in the middle and it brings you to some images of the Virgin Mary which gets you fairly close right, we're there we can hit view it and again it lets you zoom in and see a pretty high definition image, all things considered. Now, move back here. And if we go to So this is St. John the Evangelist, and again, we'll show you the images. In the past, I would simply pull it up on this page and not link you to the PIT website, but it looks like that is no longer the case. I apologize there for the confusing clicking. I would have liked to have been able to show you how it formally was done. But again, the collection website 
on the University of Pittsburgh website is pretty in-depth. It has a lot of information here, as you can see. So never fear for a museum, or not museum, but collection websites, because they can be extremely informative. So thank you all for joining today. If you have any questions or concerns, uh, please feel free to reach out. I hope you take a chance to look at some of my other virtual museum visits. Otherwise, thank you all for coming and have a lovely rest of your day.